you got a Bible, open it up to the book of Luke, to the book of Luke chapter four. We are in our series called When Jesus, and we're going to start a mini series within that series called When Jesus Heals. So today is a, an introductory conversation to the healing available in Jesus. We'll probably be in this about three to four weeks, so I encourage you, uh, if you want to understand healing, if you want to take more steps in healing, if you need healing and maybe not understanding why you're not getting that healing, stay with us the next three or four weeks as we walk through this. But in Luke chapter 4, here's what's going on. Jesus is been baptized in the water by John. The Spirit has come upon him. He spent 40 days in the desert being tempted by the enemy. Uh, and now it's time. This is immediately after he walks out of that desert experience. Now's the time for him to begin his actual ministry, his ministry. And the very first thing he does after walking out of that desert situation is in Luke 4, verse 16. Here we go. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened up the book, and he found the place. In other words, he opened it up, and he looked for a specific place in that scroll. He found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel. And he sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's a moment. That's a definitive moment that he stands up in the synagogue at the beginning of his ministry. He reads from Isaiah 61 is what we call it today. And everybody knows, everybody in that synagogue knows that scripture is about the coming Messiah. We know that scripture that we call Isaiah 61. It wasn't numbered then. We know that scripture's about the Messiah and about the Messiah's coming. And Jesus says, it's me. In his hometown, in the synagogue, you know that scripture we've been reading for hundreds of years. It's me. I'm here. Now, the question for me is, why did he choose Isaiah 61? Because if you think about what's actually going on, Jesus is trying to let them know the Messiah that they've been waiting for is here. And there were hundreds of scriptures he could have used. For me, probably hundreds of scriptures that could have more evidenced it was actually him. What do I mean by that? If you look in Jeremiah 31, it says the Messiah would be born during a time of the massacre of children. He could have said, I was born during that time. Uh, in Isaiah 7, it says the Messiah would be born of a virgin birth. He could have said, that happened with me. In, in Micah 5, it says the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. He'd say, hey guys, born in Bethlehem. He could have gone to Hosea 11, where it says the Messiah will spend time in Egypt and then come out of Egypt and say, remember my family ran to Egypt out of Bethlehem and then came back? In Genesis 22, that he would be from the lineage of Abraham. He could have gone through his own lineage and said, here's proof that I'm the Messiah. In Isaiah 40, it said that someone would come before him, meaning John the Baptist, to set the way. And he could say, you guys know John? He could have put all that together and said, look at all of this evidence of me. It's me. But instead, he quotes Isaiah 61. And I'm going to propose to you why I think he did that. I think he did that because Isaiah 61 is his job description. He read to them his job description. Here are the things that the Messiah will do. Watch me. I will do these things. Watch me, I will do these things. So if I look at this list, it's mostly a list of healing. And I'll go into a little bit more of it to explain why, but this is what he says he's gonna do. Sarah, the gospel to the poor, 
release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, there's a couple words there I want to clarify you. I want to clarify for you the word captives. Because when we're talking about setting captives free, you could think about people who are imprisoned, and that would make sense because the word in the Hebrew is akmautos, akmautos, and it means a prisoner of war. So they could have been thinking he's going to set people free who are in prison. If you go down to the word oppressed, he's going to proclaim our freedom to those who are oppressed. Now, that's a really unique word because in Hebrew, that word is thrao. Thrao, and it means breaking into pieces are shattered. He's going to bring freedom to those who are shattered. So except for this last statement about proclaiming the favorable year of the Lord, all of these seem to be a freedom or a healing or a setting free. So let's talk about when it comes to healing, what kind of sicknesses the human can have. In our human experience, what kind of sickness do we know is out there? First, we know the physical sickness. Our body doesn't operate as it's supposed to. Something is misfunctioning in our organs, in our cells, in our blood. Something is not right for us physically. Another kind of sickness we can have is mental. Something is not calculating correctly in the head. There's hallucinations. There's paranoia. There's insanity. There's an emotional sickness. I've been wounded in my past. I've been so hurt. I don't know how to get over it. I'm in bondage to it. I'm sick in my emotions. The Bible talks about, and we'll go into this in a couple weeks, maybe next week, that there's a demonic oppression that can come upon us. There were people who had demonic oppression that Jesus said, get out demon, and they were physically fine. You remember the lady who had been bent over, and he cast the demon out, and she could stand up straight. So we know there's a sickness that can come over us from a demonic oppression. And then the last one I'll say is much more generic, spiritual. That the Bible talks about us being dead in our trespasses in sin, as the Bible defines it. Not about you, but I think being dead is a thing to get healed of. <laughs> kind of speaks for itself. You kind of need healing if you're dead. So I'm going to propose, <laughs> I'm going to propose that this is what Jesus' job description in Isaiah 61 actually says. I will take care of every kind of healing that humans need. I will take care of every kind of healing that we need. And that's what we're going to study over the next few weeks. What is all in there in that statement? What does he mean, the gospel to the poor? We're going to learn that the gospel to the poor is that spiritual healing. It brings us from death to life through the regeneration of our spirit. We get healed in that way. Release to the captives, I believe, talks about demonic deliverances. Because of that, akma etos is a prisoner of war. We got to talk about what's got us in bondage and how to get free of it. It talks about sight to the blind, obviously on the physical level, can also be on the spiritual level. And in freedom of the uh, oppressed, I just think that's awesome that that word means shattered. Because we don't think of the word oppressed as shattered. But the word he used was, I'm going to give freedom to those people who have been broken into pieces. And when we talk about being broken into pieces, we don't talk about our body laying all over the street in little pieces. We talk about inside. Man, I've been shattered. I've been broken to pieces, and yet that's the word Jesus used. So the question to start with today and for this series is, do you believe that Jesus can miraculously heal you today? That's what you said. Now, I want to talk about that because that's really the first question into understanding what he's saying about his ability to heal is, do you actually believe he can do it right here, right now for you? Because the truth is that many people hope he can. We hope he can. This is what we say when we think about our own physical healing or somebody close to us. We, say, we pray prayers of hope. I'm going to ask, and I know what I want, and I hope that he wants that too, because if he does, then he will do it, but i got to leave it up to him, and I hope he'll do it. Man, that's faith right there, buddy. <laughs> See, hope is an anticipation of something positive in the future. 
So our hope is, yeah, I hope that I get healed because that's a positive thing for me. So I'm going to put my full prayer of hope into my healing. And yet Hebrews 11.1, 1, we know, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, the assurance of the positive outcome I'm looking for. Separate those two. I have a, an assurance. I, am, I know it. It's going to happen, this thing I hope for. It will happen. I have, I'm assured of that. I have a conviction that even though I haven't seen it, it's going to happen. So faith is when we have an assurance and a conviction that what we hope for is actually going to happen. I want you to hear me close because it's going to get really cloudy when we talk about healing. I am not saying that you may not have enough faith to be healed. Please listen to me. I am not saying how much faith you have is contingent on whether or not you'll get healed. Because I think the story is more complex than that. And I'll show you what I mean when we get there. But what I am saying is that if you don't know whether or not healing is available today, then you're just hoping you can get healed. If you don't know that it definitely is, how are you going to put your faith in that? So potentially the problem is you don't know enough to operate from faith, so you're just hoping. You hope you could ride a motorcycle. Some of you know how. Some of you are fully assured and convinced I can ride a motorcycle. Some of you have never ridden a motorcycle. Some of you don't know that the left hand is the clutch, that the right hand is the accelerator and the front brake, that the left foot is the shifter, and that the right foot is the back brake. And in order to be able to ride a motorcycle, you have to know I have to pull in the clutch with my left hand. I have to shift it into gear with my left foot. I have to begin to accelerate as I let off the brake, as I let out the clutch, and the combination of those things will move the motorcycle forward. And some of you are thinking, I didn't know how that worked. But here's what just happened. Now that you understood the combination of how those things work, your faith in your ability to ride it increased. Oh, now I have an understanding so I can begin to put some faith in it. I don't know about you, but when I learn something, when I experience it, and when I witness something, my faith comes into play because I have an understanding. And you're thinking, man, this is messing with my thoughts about what faith is. Listen to me. You could not come to faith in Christ unless you understood you were lost and he was your savior. So there had to be a level of understanding to introduce faith into the picture. I have to learn what it is so that I can apply faith to it. Are you with me? So I can't even have Christ until I have a saving knowledge of Christ. Why do I need him? Why has my sin separated me from God? How did he resolve that problem? But once I understand that, I can step into my faith and believing in that. So I hope I can ride a motorcycle versus I'm convinced I can ride a motorcycle. I began to learn this concept the first time I cast a demon out of someone. I'd heard about it. I had some understanding. So I began to develop my authority understanding in Scripture. What does it mean that I have authority over demons? What does it mean that they have power, but they don't have authority? That I can exercise my authority over them because they don't have authority over me, but they do have a power. But if I exercise my authority, it is stronger than their power and they can be cast out. But the first time I did it, I was amazed. I was a little scared. <laughs> Maybe even a little confused because I was learning to operate in it. But once I understood how to use my authority against the demonic, bring it on. I'm not afraid of the demonic. I see it oppressing people. I know that it can be cast out. I know I have authority over it. My faith in the ability to cast out a demon is up here now. Why? Because I understood. I had to learn my authority. I had to grab a hold of those things. I had to hear the gospel and understand what Jesus did for me so that I could put my faith in him. How can you have faith in something you don't understand? There's a difference from I don't see what I do understand. 
Because then faith comes into play that I don't see it, but I understand it. So I know that it can come. In the same way, I want to talk about healing. Once you understand healing, you grasp the what's available to you, what the scripture says and how it works, then it's easier to put your faith in that healing. Let me show you in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, 17 and 18. Right, let's start in 16. When it came evening, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Watch this. He took our infirmities and he carried away our diseases. Here's my question, believer. Do you believe that Jesus can forgive sin? Do you believe that he can take that punishment on himself in your place and give you right standing before God? See, we don't have a whole lot of problem believing because we've understood it for years and years and years that Jesus can take care of our sin. That's what Jesus does. He reconciles us to God by taking care of our sin. Now the question is, if you can believe that, why can't you believe that he can take away your affirmities the same way? Look at the scripture. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. So if I have faith to believe that he can take away my sin, which I can't see, how much bigger of a step is it to believe that he can take away my sickness, which I can see? All right, let me show it to you. Psalms 103. Psalms 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Watch this. Forget none of his benefits. Now he's about to talk about the benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities. Anybody know what iniquities are? Iniquities are the core that drives us to sin. In other words, there's iniquity, there's transgression, and there's sin. Sin is anything that breaks the law. Transgression is any time I choose to break the law. I'm transgressing the law. I'm crossing over the law. I'm doing that intentionally. Iniquity is the core of what brings me to transgress and to sin. Iniquity is what's in my heart. I have a depravity. I have an iniquity. It drives me to transgress. It drives me to sin. He says he pardons all of that. Watch. Who heals all your diseases. I don't know how you get much clearer than that when it comes to what Jesus can do. He can pardon your sins by taking them on himself. And watch this. He can heal your diseases because he took them upon himself. Jesus makes a way for our sin to be given and for our bodies to be healed. But it's more than just forgiveness and the healing of diseases in our body. Let me show you out of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely our griefs, he, talking about Jesus, the coming Messiah. Surely our griefs, he bore himself. And our sorrows, he carried. Yet we ourselves, we thought he was stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being the spanking, if you will, fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Now, let me just go back and look at a few words. Grief. It says that our griefs he bore. In the Greek, holy, holy, not holy like the word holy, but holy. That means sickness, grief, or disease in the Hebrew. Sorrows. It says that our sorrows he carried, machov in the Greek, in the Hebrew, machov, mental or physical pain. Transgressions in the Hebrew, pesha, pesha. It means a rebellion against God. Iniquities, avon, avon, a depravity or a perversity or a guilt. All of these things Christ took upon himself. Sickness, grief, disease, mental or physical pain, rebellion against God, depravity, perversity, and guilt. This is a truckload that he took upon himself. So as we go through the next few weeks, I want to teach on all that Jesus came to heal.
He starts his ministry by talking about what he comes to heal. And he says, I'm going to do that with the gospel. I'm going to do that by healing those being held captive, by healing the ones in the physical, and by healing those who are shattered. So today I want to start with the terminal illness. I want to talk about the illness in our spirit, the illness in our spirit. Jesus says he came for the poor in spirit, and he wasn't talking about financially poor. He was talking about those who are bankrupt in their spirit. There was no wealth in their spirit. Uh, Ephesians calls it dead in your spirit in Ephesians chapter 2. Read this with me. Ephesians 2 chapter 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. I just start that sentence, and I remember that Paul is talking to a group of people. And he opens the sentence by saying, you were dead. This has got to be an interesting audience. If they were dead, there's been some kind of massive resurrection going on because all of a sudden now he's talking to live people. There would not be a whole lot of reason to talk to him if they were still dead. But he says, you were dead in your uh, trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. In case you're not familiar with those phrases, we're talking about Satan and his dominion. Among them, we too all formally lived. Now that's interesting. You were dead and I used to live there too in the place of being dead. In the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature of wrath, even as the rest, that whole host. But God, being rich in mercy, withholding punishment, because of his great love, giving us an unmerited favor, with which he loved us, even when we were dead. So he is establishing that you were and I was at one time dead even when we were dead in our transgression, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Were the people... Paul was talking to dead. No, it wouldn't make any sense for him to talk to him. He said they were dead, but now they're alive for some reason because now he's having a conversation and he used the word were. You were dead. You're not dead now, but you were dead. What is this dead that he's talking about? What was the dead status that he said we were in, you were in, we're alive in Christ now, but we were dead. It's the same death that was told to Adam and Eve in the garden. The same death. You eat from that tree and you will surely die. Genesis 2, 17. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Here's my question. Does that scripture say you might die? Does it say maybe you would end up dying if you ate from that tree? He said you would die. Not only did he say you would die, he said you would surely die. And that's really an interesting phrase. I know this is not like a, you know, a, a hobby for any of you, but if you go back into the Hebrew and you look at that phrase, you will surely die, there's something very interesting about it. That word, that phrase is one word in the Hebrew. It's only one word, one word that means you will surely die. And that word is muth, muth. And here's what it means, to die, to kill, to have one executed. You will surely muth. Why is that important? It's definitive. If I use the word he was executed, nobody says, was he partially executed? Did he get somewhat executed? No, executed means it's a done deal. It's, muth is that kind of word. It says it's done, it's finished, it's death. It doesn't have any alternative meanings. It's not used in any other word, any other way, except to mean death. Now I'm going to kind of blow your mind. 
because I want to teach you something about the Hebrew, and I want you to go check it out. In the Hebrew, that sentence is yam achel muth muth. Yam hechel muth muth. And I didn't stutter. In the Hebrew, it actually says muth muth. You will surely die. You will surely die. There is a definitive there that is repeated. If you eat from that tree, you will die. Surely die. You will surely die, said twice. What do they do? They eat from that tree. I don't know why you would eat from the tree. When someone says, you eat from that tree, you will die. You will surely die. Okay, let's eat from the tree. So God goes and addresses it with him. He said, man, now that you've done that, you're walking in a darkness. You're separated from me. There's a whole new thing in play here called sin and transgression. And uh, and you, Eve, you're going to have a a lot of pain and childbirth now. And Adam, you're going to have to start toiling from the ground. But look what happens in Genesis 1, 22 through 24. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He ate from the tree of good and evil. And now he might stretch forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So if you've ever asked yourself, why did God kick them out of the garden? He kicked them out of the garden because they were in a state of separation and death from him. And he did not want them to eat from a tree that would cause them to live that way forever. I put a flaming sword in front of it, God says. You cannot eat from this tree in the state that you're in or you will forever be separated. You'll forever be in this state of death. Now, we're exploring what is that state of death. But but interestingly enough, it says, therefore, God sent them out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which it was taken. So he drives man out. And at the east of the garden, he stations this cherubim with a flaming sword that turned every direction to guard the tree of life. Now, I'm asking the question, if they surely died, how are they walking out of the garden? How are they walking out of that garden? Maybe it's not the death of the spiritual body he's only talking about. And I'll explain what I mean by only. Some have said that what happened to Adam and Eve was the death that they recur is that now their body would begin to decay. I want to give you a couple things that, although that may be true, doesn't exactly make sense that that's what he's talking about. So here's what he says. If you disobey what I've asked you to do, if you decide to follow Satan, if you decide to follow his direction, your body will decay and you will go to heaven. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a real intense punishment. You can walk with me now, or your body can decay, and then you'll walk with me later. Because he's going to give them a plan of redemption. He's going to say, make these sacrifices. Let's make things right between you and I. Jesus is coming. It's going to work out. So I don't think the death he's talking about is temporarily so that you can come back to heaven. And although that is true, he said, you can't eat from the tree of life because I don't want you to stay in this dead state. Here's what I'm going to propose to you. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that we're made up of a spirit, a soul, and a body. And I believe death came to all three. Let me show you what I mean by death came to all three. Adam was going to be able to live forever. He didn't have a decaying body. There would be an eternity with him in the garden taken care of. But now his body was going to begin to experience death, a very slow one. The soul the actual inside of man who was joyous, who was happy, who was fulfilled in God, who there wasn't nothing uh, negative going on. There was nothing to fear. There was nothing to be ashamed of. There was nothing going on that would keep us from being a rejoicing, loving, incredible human being. And yet now he experiences shame. He has to hide because now he knows he's naked. He knows that there's a transgression between he and God. So in his soul, he's experienced a death. And his spirit is now separated from God. A death came over the spirit. This is why when Nicodemus goes to Jesus and says, how do I enter the kingdom of God? He says, you must be born again 
And he says, how do I get back in my mother's womb? And he said, no, you're thinking physical. You need to be born again. Your spirit needs to be revived. It needs to be regenerated. It needs to be brought to life. There's a spiritual birth that you have to go through. So being born again in that conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus says you need a restoration. And that restoration is going to affect your body. It's going to affect your soul. And it's going to affect, expect, ha, affect your spirit. You'll see that over the next three to four weeks. But I want to move on to just talk about this spiritual death that he's talking about in Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Not physically, because I'm still talking to you, but in some way, you were dead. But by the way, the solution to that dead problem, the solution to that dead problem seems to compare back to Isaiah 61. Because in verse 4, it says, But God, being rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive with Christ. Now, let me give you a different way to look at that scripture than maybe you have in the past. God has made us alive with Christ. Now, instead of thinking next to Christ, think the application of Christ on your life. He has made you alive by using Christ. With Christ, he has made you alive again once you were dead. Christ died for our sins, and we've been made alive in Christ. Christ redeems us from death back to life. So the death that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 2 is a spiritual death, not a physical death. Titus 3, 5. He saved us with Christ. Not on the basis of the deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, the fact that God is rich in mercy, does not want to punish. And he did it by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. You got saved because there was a washing of regeneration and a renewing that went on. I don't know about you, but when you got saved, did you smell and look better? Like you just had a shower? Doesn't have anything to do with me physically. Did it have to do with my soul? Did all of a sudden my thought processes, my life and everything changed? I'm thinking all good and the bad doesn't bother me anymore. No, but there was a regeneration and a washing and a renewing by the Holy Spirit that goes on. That word regeneration is pelaganasia. And what it means is a new birth, a renewal, a recreation. Watch this, a restoration after a destruction. You were saved by a regeneration of your spirit. After the destruction that sin brought, there was a washing of the Holy Spirit that allowed you to be born again and walk as a new creation with an alive, living spirit. Are you with me? So the Holy Spirit came to bring our spirit to life and to dwell there. That's what happens when we come to know Christ. So the first illness we're talking about today is the terminal illness of the spirit, the dead in our trespasses in sin. And yet there's a very, very familiar scripture that every one of you know. I believe every one of you could quote this. John 3, 16. You've seen it in a lot of football games. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. Where are you at in your spirit? Has your spirit been regenerated by the washing of the Holy Spirit? Has it been renewed? Has that terminal illness, and when I say terminal illness, is if the spirit is not regenerated, if the spirit is not washed and restored, then you will be forever separated from God. How do I get that? I get that through grace. For by grace, you've been saved, because God has made you an offer. God has made you an offer in your sin, in your transgressions, you are separated from him, but God makes you an offer for that regeneration, for that restoring, for that renewal. Here's his offer. Are you willing to believe that you have an offense between you and God, that you've done things that he told you not to do, that you haven't done things that he's told you to do? 
that you've enjoyed the lust of this earth, that you've enjoyed the prince of the power of this air, that you've walked in ways that are ungodly. Have you done that? Okay, then there is a separation. There's a separation in the spirit. There's a death. There's a spirit that needs to be renewed. It needs to be washed. It needs to be restored. How do I get that done? You don't. (laughs) That's the beauty of it. God so loved the world that he gave his son that if you believe, you'd be saved. Believe what? Believe that he took every condemnation, every punishment for the sinful and transgression things we've done upon himself. He took it on at the cross. God poured out his wrath against sin on Christ. For the sin of all man, he poured it out on Christ. He was brutally beaten, whipped, crucified, cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me when all the punishment for sin was poured out on him? And then God says, are you willing to believe yours was there too? Are you willing to believe that all of your transgressions against God were put on Jesus at the cross? Because if you're willing to believe that, here's what you're saying. I'm going to give all my sin to Jesus on the cross. And he was righteous because he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become right before God in him. Why am I right before God in him? Because I have nothing to be punished for. Jesus took all the punishment. There's nothing to create a separation between me and God because Jesus took that separation on the cross when he was separated from God in that forsaking moment. And he's given me the opportunity to have this spirit that's within me regenerated and renewed and rewashed. And, oh, once I was dead in my trespasses and sin, give them to the cross. But I've been made alive with what Christ did. I am now alive in the spiritual realm. I am now back in communion with God. I am restored to that place I was before I was in death due to my transgression and sin. That's what this gospel is all about. See, because Jesus said, I came to bring the gospel to the poor. Those who are bankrupt in spirit need to hear what I did for them. He did it for you. Have you accepted what he's done for you? Do you believe that you need that? Are you willing this morning to say, I need to be regenerated in the spirit. I need to be washed by the spirit. I need to give all that to Christ. I need to take on the righteousness he's given me and be right before God because I believe that Christ took all my punishment at the cross and now I can walk with a regenerated new spirit alive in Christ, alive with Christ, alive by Christ and what he did for me. I'll ask you to close your eyes for just a moment and ask yourself the question, are you dead in your trespasses and sin? Are you dead in your trespasses and sin? Because right now, this morning, in this place, you can be made alive with Christ. Christ can take all of those trespasses and sin, all of the punishment for it, if you're willing to believe he would do that for you. And he will. He did it for all man, and he's just waiting for us to accept it. Would you this morning accept that Christ took all of your sin to the cross and he offers you a regenerated spirit so that you can be alive with Christ forever maybe you just want to say to God I need that I need to be out of this death of my trespasses and sin and I need to be into being alive and walking with Christ I received that for me this morning I believe he died on that cross I believe he was resurrected to show me there was a life after this I believe he can give me eternal life by taking all my sin on the cross I believe in Jesus I believe in what he did and I believe he did it for me if that was you this morning you just stepped from death to life You just stepped out of a separation eternally from God to eternally a child of God. You have been renewed. You have been restored. You've been redeemed. And now God is going to send his spirit to dwell within that alive spirit. It's going to begin giving you new desires, new direction, new things to follow, new ways to walk out this life, more joy, rejoicing. You're going to see evil at work in your life. You're going to see the joy of the blessing of being a child of God because you believe what Christ did for you on the cross and the spirit is regenerating 
your spirit and the terminal illness is gone. Father God, I thank you for those. I thank you for those who are here today who have decided it's time. It's time to be washed. It's time to be regenerated. It's time to be new. It's time to walk a new life alive with Christ. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask my altar ministers to come forward. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. If you're here today and you're struggling, you got something going on, you don't know what to do with it. Uh, you got a financial issue. you got a relationship issue. you got a health issue. These are folks that know how to pray. I'm going to call them up here to pray for you. Maybe it's an emotional thing. Maybe it's a struggle going on in your family. Maybe it's a struggle going on with your kids, with your relatives, with your parents, whoever it is. They're here for you. So I would encourage you, if you want someone to pray for you, I'm going to pray to close out the service. And when I'm done, you can come up here or you can head out to lunch. God, we love you. We thank you for what you're teaching us. And I thank you today, Jesus, for the healing that you brought to us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I hope the word today has been impactful. I hope it's been meaningful. I hope there was something said today that struck you in your spirit, that you can ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation on how you can use that in your life today. We thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you join us in the actual services at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning at 851 Johnson Avenue in Stewart, Florida. And if you'd like more information about Revive Church, check out our website. It's reviveusnow.com. God bless. Have a great day.